Hey everyone, so this year I've been trying to teach myself about mathematical objects called spinners that are used in quantum mechanics. I'm still learning and I'm not quite ready to make a proper video series about spinners yet, but I've shared all the notes I made on spinners in a series of seven one-hour talks which are linked in the video description. So the seven topics I cover are listed here and I'm going to go over them quickly so you can see if they interest you. So in part one, I cover the Bloch sphere. This covers the stern gerlach experiment where particles are fired through a magnetic field and collapse either onto the up spinner state or the down spinner state. The main concept I want to show here is that in physical space, up and down are 180 degrees apart, but in the quantum state space, the up and down states are 90 degrees apart. So this means that a quarter turn in the spinner state space corresponds to a half turn in physical space. And for this reason, when we rotate a spinner state a full turn in the state space, this corresponds to two full turns in physical space. In part two, I show how spinners can be thought of as the square roots of certain vectors. I show this by taking the Pauli matrices and writing a vector as a linear combination of the Pauli matrices to get a 2 by 2 complex matrix called a Pauli vector. I show how we can define reflections and rotations of Pauli vectors using operations that are double-sided. And then I show how some Pauli vectors can be factored into a column and a row, which are spinners. So when we do a double-sided transformation on a Pauli vector, one spinner gets the left half of the transformation, and the other spinner gets the right half of the transformation. This explains why spinners rotate half as much as vectors do, because they only get half the transformation. In part 3 I talk about Clifford algebras, which are algebras where we can combine scalars, vectors, bivectors, which are like planes, and trivectors, which are like cubes. There's also a Clifford algebra for four-dimensional spacetime, which has four vector directions instead of three. I show how every Clifford algebra contains something called a spin group, which is the even members of unit length. In the Clifford algebra for 3D space, the spin group is just the quaternions. The spin group rotates vectors using a double-sided transformation, but it transforms spinners using a single-sided transformation. In part 4 I talk about how spinners are members of special sets called minimal ideals. I start by talking about projectors, which are operators that square to themselves. So a matrix that projects a vector down to the xy plane is a projector. There's also projectors in the Clifford algebras for 3D space and 4D space time. We get ideal sets by applying these projectors to our Clifford algebra. Here we see that by projecting the even elements of the Clifford algebra, we get the up and down spinner states from part 1, which are kind of like a 2 by 1 complex column. Also, when we apply the spin z operator on these spinners, we get the expected plus and minus signs from quantum mechanics. In part 5, I talk about Lie groups and Lie algebras. I show that if we exponentiate this matrix here times theta, we get a rotation matrix in the xy plane. The rotation matrix is part of the Lie group SO3, and this matrix we exponentiate is called a generator, and it's part of the Lie algebra SO3. I show that we can get generators for all the 3 by 3 rotation matrices. I also show that the generators obey special commutation relations, which is why they form a Lie algebra. The Lie group of Lorentz transformations is SO13, and it has six main matrices, each with their own generator. And using a special change of basis, we can break up the complexified Lorentz Lie algebra into two copies of the complexified SO3 Lie algebra. In part six, I talk about how the spin groups are the double covers of the rotation groups. So the spin 3 group has the topology of the 3 sphere, and we get the SO3 rotation group by saying points on opposite sides of the 3 sphere are equivalent. This is why a half turn in the spin group is like a full turn in the rotation group, because the rotation group can't tell the difference between opposite sides of the sphere. I also talk about how spin groups are simply connected, because we can always take a loop and contract it down to a point. 
but the rotation groups are not simply connected because when we try to contract a loop on one side, the other half sort of runs away from us, meaning it's impossible to contract the loop. And in part seven, I talk about all the different representations of the 3D rotation and spin groups, like the 3D or spin one representation and the 2D or spin one half representation. We can label the representations either by dimension or by spin. If the representation has spin j, then the dimension of that representation is 2 times j plus 1. And this is just copy pasted from Wikipedia, but these are the Lie algebra representations for the spin 1 half, spin 1, spin 3 halves, and spin 5 halves. And since the complexified Lorentz Lie algebra splits into two copies of the complexified 3D spin Lie algebra, called the left and right representations, we can create many different representations for the Lorentz group using different spin numbers for the left and right components. For example, vial spinners transform under the 1 half 0 and 0 1 half representations. So a lot of that probably sounded like gibberish to you if you've never studied spinners before, but you can check out the videos if the topics interest you. You're going to have to keep in mind that I'm still learning, and unfortunately the talks contain small mistakes here and there, but I'm hoping that they're a reasonable starting point for people trying to learn about spinners. I've also put some resources in the description for other places to learn about spinners if you want to take a look. And just before I end this video, one of the more serious mistakes I made is in part 5. I say that the Lie algebra SO13 is the direct sum of two copies of SU2, and this is actually not correct. It's only correct if these Lie algebras are complexified, and Wikipedia's article on the representation theory of the Lorentz group explains all of this.